Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the conference. Hope all of you enjoyed the lunch. May I now call upon Dr. Tencent Lan to give us a presentation entitled Healthcare Reform and Financing at Crossroads. What do we learn from international experience? Dr. Tang, please. Thank you. Dear Chairman and uh, colleagues and uh, friends, uh, first I would like to thank you to invite me to uh, attend this very interesting and challenging conference. Uh, I'm delighted to be in Hong Kong again to uh, have opportunity to share some international lessons and experience about how health system should be reformed and financed. So uh, um, it's very delighted to to have all, such opportunity. Uh, today, actually, I want to talk a number of the key points with the numbers and the patterns of current global health spending. Second is the main challenges in financing of health care and health care system. Then, give some examples how health system or health finance system has been reformed in the middle and high income countries in recent <coughs> decades. And finally, I want to draw some experience lessons learned from these countries. <laughs> as soon as I arrived in Hong Kong yesterday, I emphasized to my colleagues and some journalists again and again that I'm not an expert on Hong Kong's healthcare system. I have a very limited knowledge about uh, your system's problems or challenges. So I'm not in a position to make any recommendation on how Hong Kong healthcare system should be reformed. But I actually, it's a little bit upset about a one Chinese newspaper quoting my you know, uh, uh, statement in a not uh, uh, precise way because you know, uh, they met me, they asked me, which country or region in Asia has relatively a good uh, health insurance. Then I mentioned that Taiwan has developed a relatively a good social health insurance model. But I didn't uh, recommend that the Hong Kong special government should adopt uh, the Taiwanese model. <laughs> so I need to emphasize again and again, I'm not, that's why in my major talking points, I don't have recommendation sections. So I, I want to explain this uh, once again. <clears throat> so first, let's look at the global pictures. Developing countries account for 84% of global populations. They got 90% of global disease burden. But unfortunately, only 12% of global health spending occurred in these countries. Shift in democratic, shift in demographics such as increased life expectancy, we are now living longer and, and <coughs> longer, and the trend towards non-communicable diseases and injuries is dictating the needs and the service delivery system globally. So this is very obvious. Over the next 20 years, changes in population size and population structure alone will increase total health care expenditure needs by 14% in Europe and Central Asia, and will increase 37% in East Asia and the Pacific, this region. Hong Kong is part of the Asia uh, 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 Pacific region, and 45% in South Asia. So this is a tremendous increase projected uh, by the World Health Organization in terms of health expenditure. Global health spending in 2002 got a figure 3.2 trillion, equivalent to about 10% of global GDP. We know USA, Americans spend about 15 or 16% of GDP on health care. Now, 10 or 15 years ago, when I studied public health, health services in the United States, they 
at that time, spend 17% uh, of GDP on healthcare. And uh, I just learned from Dr. Lee, Hong Kong spend about 5% of GDP on healthcare. In men and China, they often, they, they usually spend under 5% of GDP. So high income country spend about 100 times more on health per capita than lower income countries. But if we adjust for cost of living difference, still 30 times higher in high income country than in low income country. So this is a huge disparities in terms of health financing, equity in financing of health care. So the public share of total health expenditure in lower income countries is still very, very lower. Minister Gao Qiang pictured what mainland China has uh, 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 evolved. In the early 80s, the government expenditure in mainland China accounted for 40 percent. Now it's declined significantly. So although in recent years the government increased uh, significant health expenditure, so the proportion has increased uh, and now is 20 percent. But while in the high income countries, usually government health expenditure accounted for over 65%. This morning I learned the Hong Kong government spent uh, uh, about 60% of the total government budget on health, counting over 90% of total health expenditure. So this is a very tremendous figure. So these are the general pictures about health financing globally. So what are the healthcare financing challenges in these countries? I want to look at middle income country and also high income countries. I deliberately so, um, ignore the low income country because I guess the low income country situation may not be very relevant to Hong Kong. So I just talk about the middle income country and the high income country. So in middle income country, Many, many income countries have very similar health financing priorities and goals. One is universal coverage, second is financial protection, and third is efficiency. These priorities spring from the following pressures. One, democratic and epidemiology, epidemiology and technical, technological changes. As I said, the life expectancy increased dramatically. We face the number of the challenges from non-communicable <laughs> disease, injuries, as well as removing of infectious disease, like SARS, influenza, and other, you know, uh, uh, infectious diseases like HIV, AIDS, and the TB. Second, in many middle-income countries, people are still paying for health care out of pocket, large out-of-pocket payment. We define uh, OPP uh, accounted a, a total number of health expenditure over 50% is a, a, the larger OPP. So this is another challenge we are facing. We also know there are inequitable and effective health finance systems. For example, we often see that the poor and the vulnerable had a, to pay higher out-of-pocket payment for health care than their rich counterpart. We also know there are inefficiency in healthcare system in these middle income countries. For example, the occupation, bad occupation rates sometimes are very lower. Inadequacy, inadequacy mix of different health professionals. For example, in mainland China, there are more doctors than nurses. So uh, obviously this is not technically efficient. But in the high income countries, they pay more attention about the cost contaminant. Much political and scientific attention has focused on financial aspect in their consideration of health reform. And yesterday, some of my colleagues from uh, the Foundation Research Center told me in Hong Kong, people also 
very much pay special attention to how the health system, healthcare should be financed. Money is, money is very much matters. So this attention has been driven by concern for con containing the cost, the increased efficiency. At the same time, the healthcare system was substantially, albeit often publicly less visible, reformed to achieve non-financial objectives, such as greater coverage. As we have heard from Professor Mayer in this morning, New Zealand wants you know, to improve the coverage. And also comprehensiveness, for example, you know, access and, and, and equity. So bear in mind all these challenges. I want to you know, just briefly introduce what these countries have done in terms of reforming their healthcare system. In the middle income, what they have done recently is to increase risk pooling and reduce fragmentation in their multiple pooling arrangement by adopting a number of the measures. One is subsidizing the premium of the poor and sometimes informal sector worker through a general, general tax to allow them to participate in the health insurance. I will give you more detailed information about what's happened in Colombia country, in Thailand, and also in our, some neighboring countries, such as Vietnam. Several years ago, the prime minister in Vietnam <coughs> issued a decree called the health time financing for the poor. Those people live in Vietnam, living in poverty, have been given a free compulsory health insurance card in order for them to get a free health care. So this is the typical example to use the government revenue, government tax, to subsidize the poor and the vulnerable to participate in the health insurance. Second is by expanding pools through mandatory inclusion of other groups and integration of private health insurance. Uh, and uh, so that they usually create a single actual or virtual pool. One single pool, risk of pooling, would be more efficient than a number of multiple fragmented pools. So most reform carried out in these middle income countries follow the general principles of separating financing from provision, having money follow patient and using incentive-based provider payment method. As we already have now uh, uh, heard, uh, pay for performance in New Zealand and uh, in, in, in UK NHS system this morning. So give you just two examples uh, uh, from the middle income country, Columbia case study. Pro to 1993 reform, the country had a three tier <coughs> healthcare system. One is national services, NHS. Second is mandated social health insurance, and so there is private health insurance, or health services paid out of pocket. The reform was approved in 1993 through a law 100, i.e. establishing a universal health insurance coverage for all, for all Columbia peoples, to be provided by two schemes. One is called contributory regimes, CR, for those with ability to pay and by subsidize the regime for the poor. For the contributory regime, CR, 4% of salary was contributed by the employee and 8% of salary by employee. For the subsidized regime, primary <coughs> source of financing are national government transfer to municipal government earmarked for health. This is also actually uh, 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 happened in mainland China, as the Minister got, uh, indicated this morning, the central government transfer, gave, gave a fiscal transfer to central and the western part of China to set up a rural health insurance scheme. So in terms of provider payment method, in terms of fund allocation, there are two patterns of payment. One is prevent for the preventive and pro pri primary, primary health care, 
contracted money through capitation, i.e., the government or the social health insurance scheme use the capitation payment to pay for the primary health care services. However, they use the fee for service to pay for specialized hospitalization care. Ten years later, ten years after reform, over 80% of population in Colombia were covered by health plans, these two plans. Let's look at the Thailand case study. Thailand has been chosen as one of the successful uh, uh, model for uh, health care reform in Asian countries recently. Before the 2002 reform, expanding health coverage, <coughs> Thai government sought universal health coverage through four different uh, schemes. One is called the Medical Welfare Scheme, introduced in 19, uh, 1975, aiming to provide a free Medicare to lower income groups and cover about a, a quarter of the population. It was funded by general taxation and covered poor, elderly, disabled children under 12 years old. <coughs> the second is a severe, bed, severe servant medical benefit schemes introduced in 1978 for severe servant and their family members. And the third is a social security scheme. And the fourth is a voluntary health care schemes. It was introduced in 1993 to cover those in, in in never, in el, el, not eligible for any of the other schemes. The scheme collected premiums from HOSA, Ministry of Fund, Public Health, and ADB loans. However, this voluntary health care scheme was not very successful in terms of expanding coverage due to financial <coughs> uh, non viability and uh, adverse selections. But during the Asia financial crisis, occurred in 1998, about 80% of Thailand population was insured. In 2001, Thai government introduced a universal coverage scheme, UCS, aimed to deal with some of the problems of the earlier schemes and to increase coverage among the uninsured. The universal coverage scheme is a mandatory scheme funded by the general taxation and a certain bar co-payment. Every Thai people who visit a hospital or outpatient department or clinic, they only pay 30 bars, 30 bars. It emerged that this uh, medical welfare scheme, voluntary health care scheme, and covered the remaining uninsured. So universal coverage scheme in Thailand alone now cover about three quarters of its population. More recently, the poor and adult <coughs> children and, and disabled have been granted exception from co-payment. I.e., these poor and vulnerable are not asked to pay so they bar when they visit the doctors now. So this is a pro-poor health policy. <coughs> so there has been, since the reform in Thailand, there has been 25% increase in outpatient visits and 9% of increase in hospitalization both concentrated among the poor. So this is a very poor in reform. <coughs> now let's look at what's happened in the high income countries. In many high income countries, they have introduced a mandatory universal coverage for example, Australia in 1975, Portugal in 1978, Ireland in 1980, Greece in 1984, Spain in later 1980, Korea in 1989. Belgium in 1998, France 2000 had extended their social health insurance scheme to parts of population that were still insured because of prevailing principle of present and past professional status as the basis for sickness fund enrollment. The most important uh, expansions of coverage occurred in long-term care. Long-term care was not covered by this <coughs> insurance in this high-income country, now they did. So Austria, Austria in 1993, Germany in 1996, Luxembourg in 1998, and Japan in 2000. So in these high-income countries, 
they have undertaken some reforms in resource pooling and service purchasing arrangements. Resource pooling has generally, at least in social health insurance country, become more centralized. In the meantime, services purchasing, at least in most tax finance system, has generally become more decentralized. The rule of services purchaser has been significantly strengthened over the past decades. The majority of, sorry, majority of tax financed social health insurance country have introduced some form of per case payment method in their hospital financing. In medical, they call DRG, a diagnosis related groups. Most partially in some combination of global budget. So they are actually reformed in terms of using different provider payment method as a purchase, service purchase. And we also have noticed in these high income countries, the cost contaminants efforts have been included, increased, have increased the reliance on out of pocket payment by patient at the point of services use or service delivery. For example, in Japan, the co-payment has increased from 20% to 30%. <coughs> Some countries experience a transition from social health insurance to tax financing. For example, <coughs> Iceland and Spain for the purposes of cost control and equity. If you use tax financing, maybe easier to control the cost and also probably increase the equity but may sacrifice efficiency, maybe. <coughs> um, so I just try to draw some international experience and lessons. Economic growth is the most important factor in the move towards universal coverage. And also we know improved management and administration capacity is critical in expanding coverage as it is a strong political commitment. Political commitment also is very important. For countries, transitional to universal coverage, general revenue and social health insurance are the two principal sources of public fun funding. Both accumulate public revenue into one or several poles. And we also learn that resource pooling is the most critical issue whether a social health insurance, whether you want to adopt a social health insurance or you adopt a national health service, as, as we see in UK, is ultimately a chosen, is of second, <coughs> secondary importance, i.e. resource pooling is the first important thing, the financing model about uh, social health insurance and national service is the second uh, 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 important. Broader risk sharing mechanisms, instead of fragmented, smaller risk pools can contribute significantly to effective equitable financing of health coverage. We know products and services must be evaluated for the quality and the cost effective within the context of particular countries. So context is very, very important. Um, before I finish my uh, 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 talk, I want to uh, uh, talk about WHO's call for renewing primary health care. In this morning's presentation, uh, Professor uh, 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 Chris, uh, we are already you know, mentioned the primary health care. In 2008, WHO World Health Report uh, uh, used primary health care as the key topic. So WHO wants to renew primary health care in the following four aspects. One is universal coverage, second is services, services delivery, primary health care reform, and third is public policy reform, and fourth is leadership reform. So in the universal coverage, we want to emphasize health care should be valuable, accessible, comes with a social health protection for all. In terms of service delivery, primary health care reform, we want to see a very comprehensive, integrated continuum of care, and also want to see a sustained partnership with the patient, families, and the communities, and also health professionals. 
We also want to see a proper, affordable service of quality delivered effectively and efficiently. As we know, public uh, primary health care including a number of the aspects, not just the clinical services. So we should develop a right public policy. So we want to see health in all policies. Health has been affected by a number of the social determinants, not just the health care. So we want to see a health is considered in all the public policies. We also wanted to see, to develop or formulate a right public health policy and want to get a health system right because health system is so important in affecting the health of the population. Finally, we want to see a leadership, particular leadership from the government. We want to see government to pay a key role <coughs> and uh, take a more responsibility for health of the people. We want to see a more investment in capacity for effective government in terms of evidence-based health policy and policy, public policy that affected the health. So that's my uh, uh, talk. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Tang. Please take a seat on the stage. Here come to our panel discussions on healthcare financing and the options available. May I now call upon our moderator, Dr. Donald Lee, and the following panelists to come up to the stage. The Honorable Chan Kin Bo, Legislative Councillor representing the insurance constituency. Ms. Sandra, uh, Sandra Lee, Permanent Secretary for Food and Health. And Professor Nicholas Mays, please. Okay, we shall proceed now. This morning we had a lively discussion on uh, health systems and, and now uh, <coughs> Dr. Shenang Tang has set the stage for some discussion about finance model. I think he also has answered some of the questions raised by uh, those who posed questions this morning as well and uh, touched upon primary health care. Uh, as usual, uh, upon the instruction of our secretary like this morning, uh, we're going to pose some questions to this time the permanent secretary is not really posing question, but I, I'd like her, <coughs> Ms. Sandra Lee, to, to say something, sort of to recap the, the government policy or, or the way ahead in, in the healthcare finance, uh, healthcare reform, especially from the finance point of view. So, Sandra. Thank you, Donald. Um, <coughs> the secretary has set out actually what our objectives are in the healthcare uh, reform consultations. I don't, I won't repeat them there, but. We focus on financing. Let me just point out a few key words. First of all, it is not financing. It is supplementary financing. Why? Because government is totally committed. As um, Professor Tang just said, we have the commitment to provide <coughs> the type of service that we're providing for and to improve it. That's why we have committed ourselves to increasing government expenditure from the existing 15% on public, on, on health services to 17%. In addition, last year, unfortunately last year, we actually managed in the financial secretary's budget to reserve $50 billion to, now it's kept here, kept there in the reserve, um, so that when we are ready for the um, healthcare reform and the financing, supplementary financing reform, we will have some startup money. So it's supplementary financing. Why? As the Secretary said this morning, because we have full accessibility for our population. Anyone can go into our public hospital, so long as we have an ID card, and you receive treatment. This is something that is valuable. And as Professor Tang said earlier, it provides us with social security, with, with the security of the people to have the peace of mind. But all this said, why are we going ahead with the reform? Because we know that with an aging population, and remember in 2030, I will be one of them, one of the four who will be over 65 and will be dependent on our younger population to finance our healthcare expenditure, not to mention others. All these together really means that 
we will have to forge ahead. Forge ahead, not just, again, not just about supplementary financing. Because supplementary financing alone will not give us the solutions at the same time. So we said in our public consultation document in March to June last year, we have to go uh, ahead with service reform as well. And that is why primary care reform is such an important item on our agenda, and we are forging ahead with it um, in, um, starting this year, and, and, and we are actually engaging the um, various sectors and the stakeholders in that. That alone is not important, because you also see a structural problem in our healthcare market. Uh, it has been repeated a couple of times this, uh, this morning that 90% of our inpatient care actually is provided by the public sector. Government carries a very heavy responsibility in that side. The private sector, actually, they're quite interested to expand, but we must actually allow the, uh, the private sector to expand by giving them the right policy um, um, directions as well as the facilities such as land and so on. But that, again, is not important uh, along uh, to spearhead structural change. Last but not the least, the most important is the change that you and I will change. You as an individual, you as a professional will have that cultural change because the structural reform of the market and the service reform will then bring about a new culture. We need a new culture, a new mindset. And for that, actually, we have launched quite a few pilot projects on public-private partnership. That is important. <coughs> With all these reforms that we actually have already spearhead, what remains for us to do is to think, what does the Hong Kong population actually want? Now, um, the Secretary again also said this morning we have, um, we have 150 consultations um, as well as receiving 4,900 submissions as well as numerous polls. But in the healthcare, consultation. The most important message we hear from our community is that over 70% of them actually want us to continue the discussion. And on top of that, more, another 11% said that even with the economic uh, problems ahead in Hong Kong or in the world, we should continue to discuss. Now, that is a very important breakthrough and I thank the Hong Kong community and I thank all of you present for actually paying so much attention to our first stage consultation. But then, Hong Kong being Hong Kong, they agree that government should also continue to take the responsibility of providing the ultimate safety net. <coughs> they affirm the values of the safety net that we're providing for and they treasure the equitable access. But, they tend to favor, if we were to have supplementary financing on top of the existing public health care system, they should go funding for individual, i.e. you pay for your own uh, health care rather than a sort of uh, more uh, welfare type um, sort of contribution like um, you know, paying into a pool for everybody to share then they recognize there are advantages on a mandatory scheme, a mandatory insurance scheme. But again, that's very Hong Kong. We prefer the choice, we prefer the freedom. Uh, there is quite a substantial um, um, call <coughs> that, yeah, especially amongst a high income group, that risk pooling is doable, is workable. But how? Now with all these uh, comments coming in, it remains for us, and especially as the civil servants, to sit back in a room and start writing what we're going to do next. But what we do next is um, really focusing our mind with a, certain, a few principles. Whatever we do, we must not lower the standard of healthcare in Hong Kong. We must give our population choice. Now, how that choice is given is a, requires careful calibration, because we all know the shortcomings, uh, KP, excuse me, we all know the shortcoming of the existing voluntary insurance scheme that exists in the market at the moment. But we also know that actually there are quite a number, and then I gather that there are more than a million uh, private health insurance in the, in, 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 
in, in Hong Kong. So in other words, there are <coughs> quite a number of people actually would take out their own private insurance. Then it comes to the point. The point is to balance between the value that we uphold, the accessibility, the availability, the choice, and then pr at present, the voluntary insurance market is not regulated other than a very general generic insurance. How do we then also address questions of moral hazards? These are questions before us. These are questions that we have to think through. And with that, we will have to continue to co this consultation, work on the next stage consultation so that when the right time comes, we can again go to the public and see what they prefer. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Sandra. And that sets the perfect stage for us to ask our expert in insurance, the, our legislative counselor representing the insurance industry, the Honorable K.P. Chan. So maybe Mr. Chan would like to say something along these lines. Yeah. Uh 但很多提交意見的人同意其中就以自愿医疗保险最多人支持达到 包括是投保人,如果有現有疾病,不受保 是保險公司按最市場的需要而設計 那目的是確保不會有過高風險的人加入計劃 但是另一方面,事实上你要你计风险,其实根本不会的 而且有些所謂低風險的人去津貼高風險的人
其實呢個係我所謂大同世界嚇，即係做一個真真正正我哋醫療保險想做嘅嘢，因為保險有一個唔係幾好嘅，我覺得就係、是、咧，其實最需最需要人咧，通常都唔會受到保障，因為嗰個係個風險嘅問題咧，都反映喺個價錢嘅問題度。咁大家希望呢個係明白，呢個係一個一種必然道理。咁喺呢種情況之下安排咧，就喺嗰個保費都可以一個 community rating 嘅方法咧，即係一個群體嘅嘅嘅保費方式啦，將個保費劃一嘅，咁亦都唔需要考慮佢嘅年齡啊，唔需要考慮佢嘅健康情況。而唔收取唔同嘅保費，同埋咧，就算有 cam 咧，其實都唔會係即刻反映喺保費，因為唔同一間建築公司咧，如果一個夠大嘅嘅嘅一個羣體咧，其實咧一般嚟講保費可以比較低，就算將來係有索償咧，個個增加幅度亦都係比較低嘅。咁我呢度就講頭先講話誒，人哋話要自愿性係最好嘅方法嘅安排，同埋點樣解決呢個問題啦。其實喺上述嘅調查中咧，第二個最多人揀嘅咧就係嗰個醫療儲蓄户口啊，即係所謂所謂大家知道嘅一個儲蓄嘅户口啦。咁有五十八人咧同意，反對咧廿五 percent。其實我覺得呢個調查咧好有好有好有趣味同埋有啟示性，因為如果大家留意咧，如果你將呢兩個最受歡迎嘅方案，第一個就自愿性保險啦，加埋呢個儲蓄户口咧，其實就正正等於方案六嘅。大家如果留意咧，第一個第一段誒、呃、諮詢入邊咧就係、是、有六個方案啦。Option six 咧就我哋現所界覺得係最好嘅，即係包括儲蓄户口啦、強制性保險啦。咁而家大家睇到咧就話，如果你問啲市民咧嚇，其實佢咧就啱啱正正就 Option six， 不過咧就不要強制性嘅啫。咁樣即係如果大家你留意下，其實個嗰、那個嗰、那個性質就咁嘅。所以你將呢個 Option six 移除咗呢個強制性咧，就等於而家市民最中意投嗰兩個方案啦咁樣。咁但係大家如果要回到現實咧，就知啊！而家喺香港而家咁嘅經濟環境之下咧，如果仲要講強制性咧，我諗個成功機會就好低嘅。咁所以咧，我哋咧就係要考慮即係靈活啲，點樣能夠做到啊？大家市民能夠同意一個輔助性嘅醫醫療融資，又可以得到大家同意，又真係可以進行嘅咧？咁我相信咧，政府就有一道黃牌喺度嘅，就係話咧，政府其實係有預留咗五百億嘅財政儲備咧，係將貨將來呢個計劃。咁所以我諗最大課題就話點樣研究去利用呢筆錢咧，去吸引市民去自動參加，令到咧能夠達到頭先講嗰個全民保險嗰、那個嗰、那個方式咧咁樣。咁我哋一啲行家估計咧，大概有一百萬人參加咧，就可以做到我頭先講嗰樣嘢話係不需要冇冇完全冇 exclusion 嘅，咩咩病都保到，即係可以做到呢樣嘢。咁所以我我個人嚟講咧，覺得第二第二階段嘅諮詢嘅方案咧，應該有我以下講嘅特色嘅。第一咧。就一定要有儲蓄嘅功能，一定要係儲蓄。點解咧？醫療融資成個概念，點解我哋要醫療改革咧？其實因為政府計個數咧，就話二三十年後咧，其實嗰個醫療開支咧係遠遠會超過將來政府將來嘅預算嘅。如果政府改變嗰個比例，即係話講喺房屋啊、教育啊、醫療入邊，即係究竟係係邊度優先，邊度去撥嚟撥去咧？咁就一係咧就會喐到其他嘅開支，咁大家都唔想見到保安啊、教育啊嗰啲受到影響，或者居屋啊，或者係嗰啲住屋啊咁樣。咁所以咧，好可能即係一個固定嘅比例，因為而家喺醫療方面都相當多。咁所以我覺得成個精髓咧就話，醫療輔助改革一定要係而家儲錢，俾將來用。今日嘅儲錢，將來嘅要用啦。年輕時儲蓄就俾年老嘅時候用，健康時有儲蓄俾健康用。所以我覺得如果係達到唔到一個儲蓄嘅成分，將今日嘅錢儲好，帶去將來咧，冇乜意思。我成個概念冇乜意思。所以我覺得一定要做一個儲蓄嘅功能。第二咧。就頭先好似阿 Sandra 講咧，一定要係供款者有個獨立嘅户口嘅，自己供款自己用啊，即係款項唔會外流。我諗呢個係香港人特色咧，就話我自己係咁嘅需要，我希望儲我錢，唔係食大鍋飯。我希望係大家自己自己儲我錢自己用。咁如果嗰陣過咗身咧，啲錢應該係可以當個遺產咁樣承繼嚇。而呢筆錢亦都考慮係咪可以俾屋企同埋自己用咧咁樣。咁供款咧，我哋好希望咧係可以獲到稅務豁免。咁點解咁講咧？其實呢個我哋都我做咗議員之後，我推動咗好耐。咁點解我咁講？因為你諗下，如果市民啊自己願意揞自己荷包去保障自己，有事一事咧就怨公司賠咗錢啦。咁政府嘅負擔係咪少咗咧？點解政府唔肯支持呢種行為咧？點解唔顧慮呢種行為咧？咁所以我都係有大條道理。政府應該盡快考慮咧，係喺稅務方面咧係優惠所有嘅。可以逐步嚟嘅，譬如醫療嘅開支啊，醫療嘅保險開支啊，或者退休嘅儲蓄咧，其實政府應該盡快考慮嗰個稅務豁免。咁另外最最重要嗰樣咧，就係點樣善用嗰五百億去去達到參加市民吸引市民參加公款同埋全民嘅保險計劃咧咁樣。咁我諗誒、呃，如果要吸引大家做一個醫療儲蓄户口咧，首先咧就要鼓勵公款啦。咁如果唔喺強制性可以做到，咁可以點做咧？
我覺得可以考慮，即係可以真係可以，即係有創意啲、creative 啲去諗下點樣做呢樣嘢嚇。例如咧，我哋話，如果個市民願意承諾供款滿一個定額嘅，譬如話我肯供十年咋嚇，我我我就嚇去供幾多錢咁樣，咁就譬如話嗰、那個嗰、那個嗰、那個嗰、那個頂限咧，那個司令咧可以獲到 ten percent 嘅政府嘅配對或者回贈，以咗個某個數數限啊為為限，例如話我個人，因為我哋政府有啲計過啲數咧，就話大概係。三廿零萬到啦，一個人一個人應該就去到係應該係有個限額個 cap 嘅咁樣嚇。咁你就例如咧三廿萬公款，即係話咧每人咧最多可以攞到三萬蚊政府嘅回贈。咁我我概念咧就係話，有供五萬，咁啊政府咪可能俾五千咯，或者點樣？即係即係可以咁樣比例去吸引啲市民咧去去去做嘅。咁而咧市民如果要攞到呢啲咁嘅回贈咧，一定要即係簽一個合約或者係咩安排咧，就係話呢啲錢咧只可以限作醫療或者其他指定嘅用途。咁呢個就係吸引市民去點樣參加呢個儲蓄户口嘅方法啦。當然各位市民可以啊參加，大家即係一齊俾多啲意見啦。喺點樣鼓勵市民參加全民保險方面咧，政府可以資助一定比例嘅保險嘅津誒保費津貼嘅。例如喺頭嗰幾年咧，就誒津貼多啲，令到有足夠市民咧達到我頭先講個大概一百萬嗰個數目啦嚇，令到多啲市民去參加呢個計劃，從而咧係發揮呢個羣體分擔即係風險嘅功能，令到個保費咧同埋。不保嘅使用係減會最低嘅。我哋亦都可以考慮咧，係唔同年齡嘅加入咧，就收取唔同嘅保費。但係越早加入咧，就可以終身咧享用一個特別嘅折扣，從而咧鼓勵年輕人咧趁佢年輕嗰時候係早啲咧係參加呢、這個呢一、這個咁嘅計劃。另外都可以舉例咧，參加計劃每五年咧就可以獲到額外嘅保費折扣。呢啲種種都係希望個人咧持續咁樣參加呢個計劃啦。咁如果冇索償滿三年，亦都可以再一個冇索償嘅折扣咁樣。咁另外政府可以根據一啲誒嗰個產品嘅範圍啊條款咧，由政府定立啦。定立咗之後咧，就由誒現威嗰啲或者邀請嘅保險公司咧嚟嚟參加承辦。咁每年咧根據營運數字啊，包括賠償金額咧，就將個保費調整，咁啊可加可減嘅。咁我相信咧呢種咁嘅方法咧，就可以達到我哋希望可以即係又有儲蓄啦，亦都可以有風險分擔咧，令到咧整體市民咧係受惠嘅。咁呢度就大錯，我今日講嘅嘢咁都希望。可以大家咩問題都歡迎啊，同大家解解答我嘅我個諗法係點樣啊？多謝大家。I think it's certainly a very interesting proposal. Okay.、Uh, certainly, you will have a chance to respond and comment. But before we open up to the floor, maybe I can ask our two experts here to make some comments, starting from Dr. Tang, from your principles、Sorry. of financing. What do you think of this idea, for example?、Um, as I said, I have very limited knowledge about the Hong Kong healthcare system, and、um, I have heard uh, uh, that uh, the Hong Kong government is considering to、uh, undertake a number of the health system reform,、uh, including establishment of a medical saving account.、Um, because I, you know, don't know、uh, the current situation very well. well But what I want to uh, uh, point out is that、uh, about、uh, ten years ago, mainland China started to reform its open employee health insurance scheme, and they sent a number of the delegation to Singapore to learn the medical saving account system in Hong Kong. Then eventually, the Ministry of Social Security of mainland China decided to adopt a、uh, modified. Medical saving account scheme with the risk pooling, the money contributed jointly by the employee and the employees has been allocated into two pools. One is medical saving account, individual saving account. Another is the risk pooling fund. So、um, the individual contribution went to the, their own medical saving account, aimed to. Accumulate the money in a young age, and then use it in a, uh, uh, when they get old or they get <coughs> sick. These kinds of reform in many of the urban city by the Ministry of Social Security was not successful, as now uh, 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 evidenced. So the Ministry of Social Security now is considering abolish of medical saving count now. So what I try to say here is, you got to be very cautious. You may wish to analyze why medical saving count in mainland China, in the urban cities, 
for the open employees was not uh, very successful in terms of equity efficiency. So this is one point. I just want to uh, 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 raise this issue. I do not have any recommendation or suggestion, as I said. Second point I want to uh, 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 raise here is uh, many countries, including high and middle uh, income countries, probably they haven't yet spent sufficient fund or government fund on primary health care, a topic we have discussed today. And for example, in mainland China, when Minister Gao Chang said that they developed a rural health insurance scheme for the rural residents with the government subsidies, the initial policy of such a scheme focused on hospitalization, i.e. inpatient services, not the outpatient service, not the primary health care. WHO does not agree with this kind of policy because we think the government should allocate more money to support, to finance the primary health care that are most cost effective. Just to give you an example, in mainland China, there are now about 200 million, 200 million Chinese in mainland China suffer from hypertension. Less than one of the third know they got a hypertension. And less than 10% of patient, hypertensive patients are under effective control or treatment. So if the health insurance scheme couldn't cover the outpatient treatment at the outpatient department, you wait these people to develop a stroke, heart attack, then they got to be hospitalized. Then the insurance scheme is going to look after them. It is too late. So my point here is we should allocate more financial resources to support primary health care that are most cost effective. Thank you. I totally agreed. But from the insurance point of view, perhaps uh, <coughs> Mr. Chan can enlighten us. What do you view of uh, primary care insurance? Because I understand Again, it's behavior, you know, patients, the moral hazard of, of using up every single opportunity to, to see an outpatient basis. I mean, this is the, the true difficulty, I think, in Hong Kong, for example. Do you think by a sort of a total population insurance this can be solved because of the large enough pool? To me, I, I, I personally was, uh, think that the, uh, our focus for the, uh, well, our, our Hong Kong wise uh, health scheme should cover only inpatient. Because to me, outpatient is always something that has been well taken care of by the Hong government. We have very good uh, public health care system. And uh, actually, people have a lot of choice. They can use Chinese medicine, they can take some medicine, they, they, they don't even go to see the doctor. So, and uh, what's the worst is that actually there's a heavy administration work if you use an insurance system for the outpatient system because you are talking about small amount of money, but their frequency is so high that in average, in Hong Kong, I think it's about eight consultations per person per year. So you're actually doing a cash flow reimbursement basis. So it's not too much value that I would uh, see in such, such a system. Uh, so in Hong Kong, whenever we think about all this saving and uh, for future plan, I always think that we should focus on inpatient, so there would be a much more pooling effect because some people are more healthy, some people are less healthy. But your scheme is used <laughs> to protect the uh, outpatient side, then everyone have the same, more or less the chance uh, of, of, of uh, seeing the doctor, so there's not really a lot of value in, in that. Nick, maybe we can have some comments from you. Well, I'll, I'll caveat any of my comments by saying, again, I, um, I'm not making recommendations about the Hong Kong system, but I suppose just one or two thoughts. I mean, I, I think the, the issue about mandatory insurance, I had always assumed that if you're bothering to make it mandatory, then, then part of that process was to alter the relationship between um, risk, i.e. personal risk, and contributions, that that was the that was one of the reasons for having a mandatory system, was that you were trying to um, get more effective risk pooling than, than you can possibly get in conventional private medical insurance. So um, it seems to me that, that that's part of the reason for, for making it mandatory. Um, and I, I do agree, I mean, the, the, the history so far of medical savings accounts is not, is not very encouraging. 
um, from, from other countries' experience. Um, and I suppose one of the things that, um, again, as an outsider, I'd want to know a lot more about is in the current situation to explore exactly why people cannot save or are not saving and also why they don't have private insurance. Because it seems to me that if, if, if part of this idea of supplementary financing is to improve the coverage for the whole population, then understanding precisely the sorts of choices that people are having to make in order to, for example, you know, to, to choose whether to save for the cost of your retirement versus the cost of health care. Those, all those sorts of choices uh, seems to me very important. Un understanding how people use their household income and why before one gets into great detail about certain, certain <coughs> kinds of schemes which might or might not get public subsidy. Um, and I suppose, I mean, just another comment, obviously, about, about tax relief on, on any kind of contributions to, to private schemes. Of course, I mean, that's government spending. That's a cost to the government. So the question is, if the government is going to spend money on tax concessions for private insurance or tax concessions for medical savings, it needs also then to consider the value for money of the alternative, which is directly spending that money, because one person's tax relief is somebody else's expenditure foregone, so that they're identical in economic terms. They just that they appear rather different, and they have very different distributional consequences. Uh, just a follow-on question to Mr. Chan about medical insurance. I assume if we have a sort of universal coverage and all that, our reimbursement would be fee for service, is your proposal? Because this morning, Nick talked about capitation, which is a very sensitive issue and something that's proven to be somewhat detrimental to quality and probably something that the United States is experiencing, having a lot of problems. Um, in to make it feasible, for example, with a universal insurance system in Hong Kong, do you think there need to be capitation or, or, or risk sharing by the, the service provider? Yeah, definitely. I think the, in Hong Kong, we have about uh, including operating costs uh, and the uh, middlemen, the, the, the agents and the bookers that has account for about over 20%. So if we have a system that is actually managed by the government, but run by the insurance company, then we can uh, have a system where we don't need any middleman at all. The people, just like M MPF, where you can directly enroll with the company, then you can take away the middleman. Then I'm quite confident that the insurance industry would be able to minimize the, uh, the, 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 the mean cost to less than 10%, <coughs> including the profit. Uh, although on the face of it, you seem to have paid 10%, but actually with the insurance experience in running insurance business, in uh, mineralizing the moral hazards, controlling fraudulent claim, I think uh, the insurance would be, industry would be able to earn more than 20. I mean, <laughs> for every dollar that you give the insurance uh, company, they can provide system administration work and also this control of fraud fraudulent claims, then I think they, they will probably earn more than 20 to 30 dollars for you. So what's the problem? If you give them 10 dollars and they save or, or earn 30 for you. So I think it is uh, really worthwhile to do that. But I agree that we need to control to make sure that there are not too much wastage in the whole system. And if we have more than 1 million people and we have competition with, within this company, I do think that we are able to have a viable system as long as there's uh, government involvement and this sort of government panel managing the whole thing. Yeah. Now, be before we open questions to the floor, uh, Dr. Tang, I know you were misquoted by a newspaper and you're still very upset about this, but <laughs> you did mention that there, there were some merits to the Taiwan medical insurance, you know, so maybe if you could say something about that now. When I say Taiwan's social health insurance model, uh, probably is one of the uh, good models in Asia countries in comparison with those we have seen in Korea, in Philippines, or in other countries. For example, as in my presentation, I mentioned that Korea has passed a, a national health insurance law in 1989. At that time, they actually initially set up a number of risk pools, risk sharing pools. So there are a number of different uh, organized health organizations managing different uh, health insurance schemes in South Korea, fragmented. 
So then after a couple of years implementation, and the out-of-pocket payment in Korea is still very high, as high to 50%. And uh, uh, the cost escalation has been evident. So South Korea has reformed their uh, health insurance scheme and tried to uh, develop uh, one single virtual you know, risk fully. Taiwan, at, and at, at the later 1990, and at the right beginning <coughs> of setting up the national universal coverage, they have one special agency responsible for the one schemes comprehensively. And also, the health benefit package covers not only the outpatient services and also inpatient services as well as some preventive services. So in terms of financing, in terms of resource pooling, in terms of comprehensive uh, package of health services, I think Taiwan is one of the uh, good models. So that's why I said uh, we should look at uh, what has been done in Taiwan. But uh, because different countries have different contexts, as we emphasized uh, several times, I'm not suggesting that uh, which particular country should adopt the Taiwan's model. Thank you. Actually, again, <clears throat> Dr. Tang brought up about prevention and also about what we were talking this morning about developing primary care. Somehow the model that we are contemplating with hospital base only, this component will be lacking, wouldn't it? Because there's no incentive for, for self-care, for prevention, for anticipatory care. So. Maybe, Mr. Chen, how, how do you think that we'll, how this would all work together if we just focus on hospital-based insurance? Do you think government should be the one who helps to fund uh, these preventive services as there, there's some suggestion that nowadays the health vouchers are doing? Maybe Sandra would care to say something as well. Yeah, I personally is a strong supporter of preventive care. Actually, industry is trying to do and or trying to encourage the uh, or uh, the insurance clients to do more more of that. If they can prove they are doing more of this, they will get a bigger discount. So, to me, I think it is uh, absolutely necessary because the industry is not actually. Uh, we really don't hope that we need to pay more. We, we just hope that everyone is more healthy, and we are actually a uh, facilitator in uh, managing healthcare as well. Uh, but I hope that government should have the, in, uh, whether we have a mandatory or voluntary uh, healthcare system or, or, or in the insurance system, we should, government should really be the leader in promoting more exercise for the people, promoting good health, preventive care. I think that's, that's definitely the government should be doing. Sandra, care to respond? <laughs> that's precisely what we want to do and precisely what we have started this year. First of all, it's not just a simple matter of saying, let's start with a primary care reform and do all the things. There are three groups of people involved. The medical practitioner, the service provider. You need a new mindset. You need to establish a long-term relationship with your patient so that you don't only treat a cold and a cough, but then you are dealing with his or her lifestyle. Second thing is the population of Hong Kong. We have to do a lot. We must educate our Hong Kong people not to just go for doctor shopping and you know, go to the nearest doctor for a bottle of cough medicine. But finally, <coughs> how do we bring the public sector and the private sector together so that there is integration between inpatient care and primary care? And that is the third part that we have to do. And that is something that's why certain pilot projects like the PPP, certain pilot projects like looking at how do we actually will develop a primary care sort of regime, uh, models and directory of primary care doctors. These are important things that we have to spearhead. But the most important thing is we give primary care a top priority, both in terms of our policy priority as well as as individual, we believe that that would help us to live a far more healthier and happier life. And um, we have already started, and Gabriel actually is leading a group um, to look at various aspects of primary care involving um, quite a number of service providers. And where it comes to the insurance part, I think if we, we, we can do a lot, government can do a lot in terms of 
also creating new ideas. Uh, I know recently there has been the concept of money follow the patients. The healthcare vouchers of $50 times five vouchers a year for the elderly, it has been subject to quite a lot of comments. But this is the first time we have actually used government money and have that money follow the patients. So I ask for the patience of the community and let us give this a try and see how it goes, how it works, and that can be expanded in the future. There are others that we have attempted, like um, the flu jab, the flu injection for children under the year um, of six years or below. Government subsidized the injection and allowed the private practitioner to participate in it by not capping them, actually. Uh, they are free to charge as much or as little as they want. Now, this is another kind of public-private partnership and, and you know, the, the, the actual service is provided by the private side, but some of part of the cost is provided by the public and it's a form of primary care <coughs> in the system. We are embarking on that, but we need, we need the, um, the service provider to work hand in hand with us. Thank you. And so with these remarks, maybe we will now open the question to the floor, conducted by Pang Wong. Okay, thank you. Here come to our Q&A sections. Uh, all participants uh, are welcome to put questions to our panelists. Uh, please feel free to ask questions in languages of your own choice. Uh, you may line up uh, in front of the mic stand on the two sides. Uh, may I remind you to limit your questions or comment in two minutes. Before asking the questions, please also identify yourself. Okay. Please, anybody want to ask questions? Oh, please. I'm Alex Song. I'm the uh, from the Hong Kong General Chamber of Commerce. This question is uh, to our overseas uh, uh, visitors. Um, doc, uh, Dr. Tang made an analysis on the high income and low income as a distinction between the two types of approaches. Um, is there any um, uh, sharing with us on sort of small economies and large economies in terms of population? You know, Hong Kong, seven million people, not a big, you know, compared, compared to other economies. Is there uh, some <coughs> observations on, from that dimension? Thank you. No idea. <laughs> um, <coughs> I mean, you've got enough people. Got the, what the issue is. I mean, if it's risk pooling, then I would have thought seven million is adequate. Um, if you're thinking about economic resources, I would have thought they're adequate to, to run a decent health system. So, um, I mean, th this is just a, you've given me an opportunity to say something I was, I was going to say at some point, so I may as well say it now. Uh, and that's, that's uh, I've said it to a few people over lunch. Um, it, it, it does seem to me that one additional um, part of your debate could be um, more consideration of the extent to which um, spending on the health care or the health system and the health care system needs to be thought of quite carefully as an investment in the economy. That there's a tendency, and we all do it, to think of health care spending as a, as a cost. And then obviously in a low tax uh, setting like Hong Kong, to see more health spending as particularly public spending as essentially a tax on the economy. But you'll recall that the World Health Organization recently had a, um, a commission on, on um, macroeconomics uh, and health, um, which uh, Jeffrey Sachs chaired. And, and that, I think, showed that um, the relationship between a well-functioning health system and spending on, on the health system and the economy was broadly positive in each, at, each, at each point in that link. That, that spending on the health system and health that, that was increasingly a positive relationship. We were doing, more, there are more things we can do that are effective. And, the, uh, and that there was, even in high income countries, still evidence that the better functioning health systems tended to have the more productive economies. And you can see the opposite of that happening in the former Soviet republics where the de deterioration of their healthcare system has directly affected their economy. So I think, I think Yes, of course, you know, you, you, you're, you're concerned about your other 
economic competitors in the region and, and whether you're, uh, that whether further particularly public, but any spending on healthcare would be seen as, as perhaps detrimental to the economy. But I think it would be worth reviewing in a Hong Kong context the implications, the current costs of the healthcare that is not received. And for example, what are the current costs to your economy of the waiting times for hospital treatment? That would be, the, that would be a starting point because that's an area where the public sector is heavily involved. I suspect the economic costs are quite high. So uh, some of my colleagues at the London School are, do, are doing some more work <coughs> with, with the European Union and the European Observatory on Healthcare Systems and have just published a, a review of the, of the contribution of healthcare spending to economic performance in high and middle income countries, which is very interesting. I think we'd always assume that judicious investment in the health system would be of great economic benefit in poor countries. What's interesting is that there is considerable evidence, even in much, much wealthier countries, that, that a well-organized health system, uh, and particularly one that is, is um, collectively financed in uh, where all workers, for example, have access to it in a relatively timely way, could be economically uh, quite, a, quite a useful investment. So it's a question of turning this thing around. Is it a cost or is it an investment? It's obviously a mixture of both, and it's a question of working out in the Hong Kong context, where does the balance lie, and where is your current health system weakest in terms of its ability to contribute to the economy? The Thanks. gentleman on that side, please. Uh, excuse me, oh, sorry. Dr. Tang would like to just... Just add, uh, I entirely agree with uh, what uh, Professor Mel said. I just want to uh, add a couple of uh, points in relation to uh, small population and large populations, uh, not the high or middle incomes. In some of the OECD, first Hong Kong, I think, is one of the developed economies in terms of average GDP per capita. In some OECD countries, there are some countries with uh, uh, similar population size, like uh, Finland, five millions, and like Luxembourg, a few people than Hong Kong. But these uh, 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 countries with a small uh, population <laughs> at uh, the developed economy spend uh, much more uh, on health care than what Hong Kong has spent. They have much better and uh, more comprehensive health care scheme uh, 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 in these countries than in Hong Kong. They have a high tax as well. Yes. <laughs> Much higher tax there. Okay, uh, the yep. gentleman. Hi, uh, my <coughs> name is Peng. I'm with a consulting firm. We, we work with both the Food Health Bureau and with uh, private insurance companies in Hong Kong on uh, medical insurance issues. I have one comment and uh, two questions. One question is, uh, I, I think that on the, uh, in terms of insuring outpatient services I, it doesn't have to be a one or zero absolute exclusion or ex, absolute inclusion in a mandatory program uh, I think the concern here are chronic diseases so you have things like disease management programs which I think if someone hits the trigger then they could be perhaps uh, counted as a as an inpatient case because uh, it's in the interest of the insurance companies as well to you know, to look after such patients. So I don't think it has to be an absolute one or zero in terms of covering outpatient services. Uh, the two questions, first one is, I was, um, I'd be interested to know, uh, doc, Dr. Tang, uh, when you say that uh, financing through taxation is more equitable, I was, I was wondering if you could elaborate on, on that a bit more. Um, and the second question, Perhaps if we have time later, you know, at the end of the session, you could touch on this. Um, you're saying that medical savings accounts in China have not worked in the, uh, the, the urban social health insurance system. Um, if you could just elaborate on that just briefly as well. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Tang. Now, okay. Uh, Thank you. Saving medical saving count in an um, open employee health insurance scheme in mainland China. Um, it's a little bit complicated. In a few large cities like uh, Shanghai or Shenzhen, um, these insured would be entitled to use money from their own saving account 
to seek health care from either for, for outpatient or inpatient department. Uh, then once they spend up, run out of their money from their own saving med medical saving account, they go to pay out of pocket up to 5% of their annual salary. Then they would be entitled to use the money from risk pooling fund to seek further health care. So this is what has been uh, 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 practiced in a few large cities, uh, most diverse cities in um, urban China, Shanghai, Shenzhen. Uh. But uh, over 90% of urban cities in China are doing differently. Money from medical saving account are only allowed to pay for outpatient services. Money from the risk pooling fund are allowed to pay for hospitalization, so they are separate. Okay, so those people who suffer from chronic disease like hypertension, diabetes, and they need a regular treatment, they found the money from medical saving account ran out quickly. So for example, in the January, February, they have money, but after April, May, they ran out all this money anyway. Those people who are very healthy, they wouldn't use any money put into their medical saving account. So after five or 10 years, they have lots of money. So there are no risk sharing or resource pooling in terms of medical saving account in urban employee health insurance. So that's why the Ministry of Social Security is considering a change of this system. So this is your first question. Oh, your second question. Your first question is why tax-based <coughs> health insurance scheme are more equitable? Well, it's, it's, if you look at the UK NHS, National Health Service, this is a, a government-supported uh, health uh, care uh, system. Everybody could go to uh, uh, see their GP. If the GP couldn't deal with their uh, problems, they could refer to the hospital for specialty uh, care. So uh, in terms of equity, I, I think it's, it's very good. But uh, obviously we know uh, because of lack of funding, there are long queues uh, for surgical operations in the UK. I personally had lots of experience about this. But usually, social health insurance contribute jointly by the employee and employees often require some deductible payment and co-insurance payment uh, and uh, in the ceiling levels in order to control the cost escalation. So people from the lower income country may not be able to afford deductible you know, uh, uh, payment or co-insurance payment. So relatively, obviously this is in general, it's, uh, uh, we look at a number of the tax finance, the National Health Service Scheme, we look at the number of social health insurance schemes in different countries, this is a general conclusion and may not apply to a specific cases. Thank you. <coughs> okay, the lady over there. Thank you. Uh, Judy, go away, Gabin. All the Monday, okay, that let yet ego session. I gone health care financing. Okay, that you see, now young go down your go ming yin. Go a chin, my tin son dealer like a mess you son sang. All I'm chun say, guy go to Jing Fu, Dong Ga, do I do tow tongue gun health care financing. You go Monday. But I think we talk about health care financing can't only talk about finance. We use money, have money, have a good source. How do we use the money? The resource allocation can't only talk about financing. If we have a good financing system, but we don't use it, 我哋啲錢係浪費嘅嚇，所以我我喺樹上講一少少，我哋依家 existing healthcare system 裏邊啊 resource allocation 擺好多喺 medical care、hospital care 喺 primary healthcare 嗰度佔得好少，所以我哋喺 SARS 嘅時候出現咗好多問題，因為我哋個 medical 同埋我哋個 health 係分開嘅。
嚇，依、啊这個 structural 嘅問題同 financing 嘅問題唔可以分得開，同行政管理同 resource allocation 唔可以分得開。我覺得應該係結合埋一齊嚟諗。第二樣，頭先阿阿處長講到，好強調今次我哋講 financing 係講 supplementary financing。誒我都明白，因為我睇過個文件，但係我好唔係好明白嘅，就係係唔係我哋原底政府俾咁多已經好夠、好足夠，已經係好掂。我哋只係 supplementary 嗰啲唔掂，所以我哋要講 supplementary financing 咧咁。好啦，如果將來有個 supplementary financing 嘅 system 整到出嚟之後，係咪呢一筆錢就係用喺 supplementary 就係？啊、就唔用喺其他嗰度兩筆錢兩筆帳係分開嘅咧，我唔係好明白。咁呢處咧，我我有少少即係問題嘅。頭先啊，阿陳議員講到 health primary health care 啊 ，clinical 啊，即係睇 our patient 啊，已經 look after 得好好。誒、呃，故之然我哋有香港嘅 health primary health care 誒 medical care 係好好優勝過好多國家。但係我自己嘅經驗同埋我喺地區度見到我哋啲居民嗰啲經驗咧，好多個。喺 outpatient 仍然又係要排隊，依家就電話啦、預約啦。但係如果你講預預約都唔係好夠噶嚇，所以好多都睇唔到證。然後喺嗰個 medical 啊嗰個 specialty 個 care 嗰度咧，可能要等兩個月、三個月、五三半年、一年、兩年、三年等個 appointment。所以喺嗰個 outpatient 啊 specialist 個 clinic 嗰度咧係唔夠嘅。咁所以我認為。唔好講 supplementary， 而係個 basic 嗰度都唔係好夠。咁依處咧 ，go back to 我哋仍然好強調依個誒 primary health care 個 prevention 同埋 health promotion， 以及除咗 medicine 之外咧 ，nursing 同 allied health 個 role 咧係好重要。我哋可以用多啲，可以幫助喺個 health promotion 嗰度減少醫療方面嘅壓力。第三個咧，從為我自己作為一個 user 個角度嚟睇咧，啊，我希望咧。就中產嘅人士嚇，能夠得到多啲嘅照顧，因為如果政府個應承咧，就係嗰啲撈收低收入啊嗰啲咧，就係哦可以包多啲。但係中產嘅咧，我哋我我認為市民係應該 pay for， 即係佢 ability 應該可以 contribute 啲嘅，唔係完全依賴政府。但係亦都要照顧到，當呢啲中產人士如果有啲危疾啊、緊要嘅疾病嘅時候咧，係唔夠嘅。如果醫療個保險又唔包嘅時候咧，依啲中產人士咧將來會陷入一個好好慘嘅境地嚇。多謝。多謝。多謝。多謝。誒、um, ，首先咧解答嗰個點解叫 supplementary financing， 因為政府仍然係會繼續提供呢個公營嘅醫療服務嘅，但係我哋卻步不前咧。頭先嗰位女士講話排隊排得長，等好耐先睇到 SOPD 呢，就會更加惡化啦。點解？因為我哋係計過我哋嘅預預誒，我哋嘅數據係話俾我哋聽，二零三三嘅時候，我哋今日政府係大約用三十幾個 billion 達一年，但係我哋係會。倍數四倍以上，無論公司型都會四倍幾以上嘅開支。頭先陳議員都有講過，我哋亦都係喺第一次諮詢嗰陣時，向市民解釋咗，如果我哋卻步不前咧，日後咧就要等好耐先有得睇醫生噶啦。無論點樣投資落去咧，政府都係唔可以支持呢個咁大倍數嘅開支。咁但係政府係唔可以話。我哋就坐喺度唔做嘢嘅，咁所以咧，政府仍然會繼續投放我哋嘅資源落去，亦都同時咧，我哋公營嘅架構咧，一定係會將我哋嘅效率咧係繼續咁樣去改進嘅。不過，如果我哋知道問題都係喺我哋前面嘅時候，我哋要點樣處理咧？公營嗰個責任一定要照顧誒。呃 acute emergency 啦，即係嗰啲誒緊急嘅情況啦，或者長期病患啦、訓練啊等等。不過而家其實我哋睇到，正如頭位女士講，其實我哋都有好多人士咧係為咗我哋自己本身個人嗰個健康而擔心嘅。所以市面上真係有百幾份嗰啲誒私人嘅保險嘅。咁但係而家你哋所用嘅錢係唔係？
到好好嘅保障咧，咁現時係真係有佢好多短處嘅，即係嗰啲誒私人嘅醫療保險。咁呢個頭先阿陳議員都有講過，我哋就好希望 supplementary financing， 無論用邊個方式，都係市民。如果你認為你可以參加。呢、这個一個計劃嘅時候，你嘅錢係用得其所，所謂你要 get your value for money。再重要嘅時候咧，就係、是、俾你一個長遠嘅保障，就唔係即係淨係要完全依靠翻一個公營機構，因為咁樣你有一個選擇，有個選擇係現實係有一個分別嘅，公營機構你係冇得揀醫生嘅。如果係另外一個計劃，或者你可以選擇佢哋嘅醫生，或者你可以選擇你嘅醫院，你有其他嘅嘢可以選擇。但係要做到呢一步嘅時候，究竟我哋點樣保障？如果係有一個計劃出嚟嘅時候，錢係用得其所，亦都同時咧係唔會俾人哋濫用嘅咧。呢、这、一個咧係我哋面對需要解決嘅問題。頭先我亦都聽到啊，阿鄧教授講咧，就係話啊，內地咧嗰個所謂即係儲蓄嘅户口咧，係即係嗰個計劃係唔係好成功嘅？呢、这個正正講中咗我哋點解要做呢一個醫療改革，包括呢一個輔助融資，<咳>就係、是、因為無論你儲幾多錢，除非你真係好有錢啦嚇，你係從來唔可以知道你一生所需要嘅開療醫招係要幾大嘅。有啲人好好彩，有啲人真係唔好彩，特別喺 chronic patients 嗰度。咁究竟儲幾多先夠咧？所以就引起另外一個議題啦，就係、是、我哋要將我哋所謂 risk pooling， 如果能夠有 risk pooling， 將嗰、那個誒、嗯、即係集中咗之後，可能咧就能夠咧解決嘅問題咧就方便好多啦。咁但係呢一個咧就引致即係各界對於保險嗰個意見啦，亦都係會引起就係話，如果你唔係有一個強制性嘅保險，你點樣可以揾到一百幾十萬人去參加咧？十萬八萬冇用嘅，因為你嗰個保費會好貴。咁但係現時係一個冇監管嘅市場嚟嘅。咁政府一向我哋係崇尚一個自由嘅誒、呃、經濟嘅活動，但係為咗保障嘅市民。如果係有一個計劃咧，政府係應該責無旁貸咁樣去監管呢一個制度嘅。阿阿陳議員啊，首先好多謝頭先嗰位女士提出嘅問題啦。咁誒、呃、低下階層咧，其實真係好有問題。咁我諗又都係正正我哋而家點解要做 health 誒、呃，即、就、係、是、healthcare financing we 呢個改革啦。即係因為咧，就係、是、其實我都好可惜咧，就話、是、喺第一個階段嘅諮詢咧。雖然誒好、呃、多位人士都去努力咁講，但係個市場或者香港嘅社會收唔到好重要信息就話，成個構思就係話要將中產係可以幫你儲蓄啦，因為大家知道公款一定係要萬蚊或者一萬蚊以上啦或者更加高啦。咁啲錢咧就可以俾佢哋咧去將來老來咧自己用啦。咁變咗就可以脱離咗咧嗰個公營嗰個系統啊，即係唔使依賴公營，即係連中產呢啲一班譬如百幾萬人咧，唔使用嗰個公營系統咧，就可以留翻多啲資源啊，俾嗰啲係低下階層嗰啲人。好可惜個社會咧，俾人轉化為咧，好多人鬧，最鬧得勁咧就係嗰啲低低下階層嗰啲人。其實嗰啲嗰啲組織，我覺得好係好好有責任咯。譬如我哋去講啲諮詢會咧，都未講嘅，起身喺度鬧啦。但係佢都唔知佢哋就係正正政府諗第諗辦法，想保障佢哋，因為多啲人離開咗公眾體系，咁啊變咗佢哋嘅資源咪係多咗咯。咁佢哋咪可以用一更好嘅 service 啦。同埋我哋佢哋永遠都唔係要公款嘅人嚟㗎，因為因為我哋大家知道佢哋就係我哋我哋絕對唔係歧視中援或者咩，但係咧。其實好多社會弱勢社人，我哋係應該幫佢。但我哋做法係點咧？我哋只係咧將嗰啲中產需要嘅資源咧移離咗呢個制度，令到佢哋有更加多資源。所以其實佢哋係受惠者嚟，但係呢個信息出唔到咯。咁所以大家你諗下，如果你再唔做呢樣嘢，結果會點咧？中產又要逼埋喺政府系統嗰度，咁結果咧就係話，所以咧低下階層更加用唔到。咁所以大家明白咧，我哋係知嘅，亦都明白點解咧？我喺呢、這個。誒 HMDAC 即係呢個誒醫醫醫療諮詢委員會做咗有零五年開始做啦嚇，我真係深深感受到咧香港嗰、那個嗰、那個醫療制度條係係一個病入膏肓係一個癌症嚟嘅，如果再唔去解決咧，大家中產階級要攬起決心要去解決呢個問題，唔係咧，但係你一定係一定係非常之後悔，因為根本就冇錢俾大家嚇。
。咁呢個第一個問題係即係話低下階層喺呢個身份入邊或者嗰個存款係點？第二中產啦，中產我自己都係工產嚟㗎，所以其實我仲緊張過大家。我覺得咧絕對你講得啱嘅，就係話咧即使有一個誒、呃、保險嘅制度咧，其實如果係遇到啲所謂 critical illness， 係用好多錢啊，譬如癌症啊或者係要移植啊。政府係應該責無旁貸咧，係應該係有一個，譬如我哋話，我哋最多俾到係十萬蚊嘅，或者個家庭嘅收入嘅五個 percent 或者 ten percent 以上咧，政府應該係責無旁貸咁去負責呢一個數目咯。咁我相信政府亦都會喺呢個方向度諗嘅，所以呢位女士都唔需要太太過擔心。咁但係咧就係大家大家大家一定要咧，即係參與呢啲討論，同埋真係表達你嘅意見啦。因為我覺得呢個咧係係好值得去考慮儲蓄，加一個即係風險分擔所謂 pooling 嘅制度。頭先講到國內點解佢唔成功呢？因為佢頭先講到好清楚啊嘛，有啲人有户口大把錢，有啲人就冇曬錢。點解咧？因為佢冇 b u s i n e pooling 啊嘛。如果大家都係有錢，冇有病冇病咧，都要攞一筆錢出嚟咧，就都做做。其實就係分擔咗啲錢咧。嗰度或者如果大家有興趣，我慢慢解俾你聽。呢個咁簡單，未必講得明嘅。但係其實係有呢個機制喺度咧，就係、是、要針對咧，有啲人咧係儲到好少錢，有啲人儲咗好多錢。咁點樣令到佢均即係、就是、平均化佢咧？就係、是、靠呢個 b u s i n e pooling 呢、這個這個保險制度咯。啊！但係大家有需要，我諗大家都知嘅。如果唔知，我但係慢慢解俾你聽嚇。咁希望答到頭先嗰位女士嗰個問題啦。Okay, the gentleman on this side. My name is Stephen Cha. I'm a very humble cancer survivor, <laughs> so I'm a patient. I would like to see that two clarifications. One is on the uh, uh, from uh, from Mr. Chen, the from the account uh, uh, from Mexico, yeah, insurance industry. Uh, <clears throat> If we are going to have a mandatory insurance scheme, would it cover those who are not contributing? In other words, those who cannot afford, including those who are unemployed, the uh, old, the aged people, and people who have handicap, would it cover those people? I don't know whether I, I, I heard it right or not. You just mentioned that the purpose of this scheme is to allow people who can afford to contribute to go to the private sector, the private sector, and those who can't afford the low-income group would go to the public sector. Then would it, would it bring another problem, the problem of inequality and lack of choice? So I, I wish you would clarify this point. And another point that has puzzled me a lot in the past uh, year or so, I don't understand. Uh, when we stress that the Hong Kong is uh, having a low tax uh, system, and we have to protect this system. But when you are trying to implement a mandatory insurance scheme, from a taxpayer's point, I have to pay every month the amount that you ask me to pay, apart from the tax I have to pay. So I want to ask uh, Ms. Lee, what's the difference by uh, having a mandatory uh, insurance scheme asking taxpayers to pay 4% or 5% compulsorily instead of just increase a 5% tax. What's the difference? From my, from my point of view, there's no difference at all. You know, I have to pay the same amount. Uh, I, I wish Ms. Lee would explain that to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, I will steal the, um, the request and answer both questions. <laughs> First of all, the point about the proposal that's put in the first <coughs> consultation document about mandatory insurance uh, together with the savings element, right? That one. It was not the intention that it should be universally applied. The starting point was it should apply to people above a certain income level. So say, for example, maybe people earning above 20,000, 30,000, we had an open mind then. Then that would apply to them for the scheme. Second part of that scheme is, well, we would also allow people to join voluntarily because some, there are many non-working population but are fairly wealthy. So they may also want to join the scheme. So when you ask about the uh, disabled, the, um, the maybe uh, some other um, with um, age, them, you know, depends on how old they are, we don't stop them from joining. 
maybe they don't meet the income level, we would accept them in that proposal. That was the point about mandatory insurance. The second question you asked was low tax system versus <coughs> mandatory insurance that I'm actually increasing your tax. Now, first of all, if you look at the tax system, the tax system in itself means that you pay your tax and the entire population take a share of your payment and that is used, right? Uh, I should put it very bluntly. You pay $5,000 tax. That $5,000 is used through government's expenditure for the entire population, right? For, man for any mandatory scheme, you pay the money, government doesn't take it away from you. It is not tax. That money is used in a scheme which would give you health protection. <coughs> right. So that is the mandatory part. But that doesn't mean that government is going to take away, I dare say, your rights to use the public service. Because even in the part one consultation, we have stated very clearly, government should also expand the safety net. Government would continue to provide health care for all eligible persons, meaning that Hong Kong citizens with an ID card. I'll give you an example, very simple. You may have a mandatory insurance scheme or something of that kind. If you choose not to use that scheme, you can still go into a public hospital. And in fact, there will be occasion, and if unfortunately you have to, resort to certain major surgery where you think the government hospital would be better, then you don't use your mandatory insurance scheme and you go. And that was the concept when we put that out. It wasn't meant to be extra tax. It is not a form of tax. It is a form of you contributing towards a pool in order to give yourself better protection as well as more choice. That was, um, that was it. Maybe. Because the first one, Mr. Kuen, can use English to ask me, but I think this question is very important, so I'll use English to answer, because I won't be able to say, or that you will be clear to me. We are talking about Hong Kong. Actually, Hong Kong is a very big problem. Especially when I feel like the law will feel like that, many times, 大家針對問題成日都講緊平等啊、人權啊啲嘢，但係其實香港其實係全世界最自由嘅國家，亦都係自由地方啦，唔好講國家嚇，好自由地方。有時我覺得係太過自由添，係嘛？咁另外咧就係話咧，嗰、那個對人權啊非常之尊重嘅，同埋咧，你睇下我哋香港嘅綜援啦，要一個四人嘅家庭咧，其實可以攞到係接近超過一一萬蚊喺最近單人工之後，招呼係唔錯嘅。嗰啲人攞綜援嘅睇醫生亦都係唔完全唔完全唔需要錢嘅，交租都唔需要。咁我覺得香港咧喺相對其他世界嗱，我哋每一個人，我哋有能力都希望照顧其他啲人，我絕對係 no doubt 嘅，即係一定係傷殘啊，或者我一定要照顧佢，呢個係冇問題。但係我覺得亦都係咁樣，有好多中產咧好辛勤咁去做嘢，佢哋要交咁多税，佢哋係咪應該亦都有一個相當合理嘅要求，就係話佢哋應該佢哋有個比較好嘅待遇咧咁樣。咁所以我哋而家諗緊嘅嘢就係話咧，如果我哋有一個好嘅制度，佢哋只儲錢嘅喎，你大家明白啲錢唔係政府㗎嚇。自己每個月揞一筆錢出嚟儲，儲咗之後佢老來啦，佢需要錢嘅時候，係咪應該俾佢哋去睇翻醫生睇好啲咧？咁樣，我哋又點樣啊？除非政府另外揞錢，點樣照顧其他咧？就係、是、話我哋將佢等佢唔使用咗公營嘅制度咧，就變咗佢哋咧可以騰翻多啲資源嚟俾佢哋用咯。咁我哋千祈唔好同我講話每個人係 equal， 因為點解咧？嗰啲中產好慘嘅一樣係一樣面對失業啊嗰啲嘢。咁佢哋咧，我覺得佢哋儲咗錢之後，佢哋應該係有一個制度。咁如果嗰啲啊係其他人咧，佢唔係喺呢個強制性入邊，佢自己願意參加亦都好歡迎嘅。但係咧就係話邊個儲錢都自己用翻佢啲錢咧，係絕對應該咯。就唔好話佢有儲錢，仲要照顧埋嗰啲政府已經照顧緊咧。我覺得就未必係可以做到香港去到呢個情況。如果我哋有能力，我相信每一個人都願意。但係我哋未去到呢個階段嚇，<笑>希望大家明白我想講嘅嘢嚇。Okay, uh, because of time, uh, may I uh, limit the three questions from the standing three gentlemen? Okay. 周伯展 ，OK， your turn， please。唔該，李鵬講，多謝主席。我係周伯展醫生，係香港醫學會嘅副會長。我呢個問題想誒問下陳建波議員嘅。係。你頭先提出嗰個保險嘅誒制度嗰方面咧，我好多點咧都好同意你
。第一點，我想你澄清一下，你係咪話嗰個保險呢？淨係或者大部分係保佢住院？如果係嘅時候呢，我就必須向你反映一個事實。我哋而家醫學個科技等等，係進步到呢，係好多手術係可以係誒、呃、門診咁樣做嘅，即係唔需要住院嘅。我自己就眼科醫生，所以我就比較熟悉眼科啲嘢。我哋由眼最前邊嘅角膜移植，去到青光眼，去到白內障，去到眼底嘅視網膜手術，基本上全部都可以喺門診做，唔需要入院。你未、呃、提出呢個制度，現行嘅制度嚟講，已經有啲病人呢，所謂有少少濫用或者呢個名詞用得太過嚴重一啲，就係點呢？明明呢個手術係可以門診做嘅，但係佢話我對你嘅門診冇信心，我要入醫院做。咁為咗咩呢？大家心知肚明就唔講出嚟。咁你如果係咁嘅時候呢，我相信其他科一定係咁，因為而家越講越多嘅微創啊咩呢，基本上係唔使住院。我都相信將來如果你咁樣樣嘅時候，你淨係保佢住院，咁就會令到呢。根本上個科技而家進步就係幫助咗個社會慳翻啲資源。我哋唔好淨係睇佢保費或者邊個俾錢，政府俾錢自己俾錢，而係成個社會嘅資源咧係慳翻嘅。但如果你淨係保佢嘅時候咧，就有好多嘅投保者咧就會經呢個途徑而浪費咗呢啲社會資源。咁我想聽下你嘅。而家嘅諗法同埋將來你會點諗？好啊，好啊，我諗呢個係有兩個問題嘅。首先我哋講緊咧就係話誒，現在嗰個保險制度點樣去解決？頭先講嘅問題咧咁樣，因為呢個問題咧係以前冇嘅，但係呢幾年咧好似你話齋好多嘢都可以咧，唔喺醫院做就喺誒即係個診所做啦。有好多診所設備都好好嘅，所以可以做到好多嘢嘅。咁所以而家我可以咁講咧，係保險界嗰啲保單係追唔上嘅時代嘅需要嘅。咁所以係需要一個改革嘅，即係話咧將來分類就話喺醫院。啊 ，inpatient 係一個賠償額啦，診所賠償額一個診所入邊做手術另一個賠償額，咁我同意呢樣嘢嘅，咁我都翻希望翻去會推動呢樣嘢係係進行呢樣嘅啦。你講翻去嗰個誒、呃、強制性或者保險嘅制度，點解我我我個人嚟講唔即係就唔贊成呢、這個用包埋呢個 out out patient 即係誒睇普通科醫生咧？主要就因為係咧，大家諗諗啦，如果我哋計個數咧嚇，如果我哋係一個強制性淨係做住院嘅，咁咧就大概要起碼要三個 percent 你嘅人工先得。但係如果你要補埋呢個誒門診咧，你可能要九個 percent 喎。咁大家會唔會供九個九九個 percent 先？大家即係要好好好老老實實去做呢樣嘢，因為點解咧？你唔包門診咧，冇咩問題，因為點解？嗰啲人去睇中醫啦，可以睇食成藥啦，可以可以自己去運動搞掂啦，屈啲日都冇嘢啦嚇，或者係睇政府醫生啦，睇私人醫生乜都得嘅。但係你夾硬要佢供咧，其實我哋講咧，其實個結果就係咧，你每個月咧，如果你睇個 out patient， 起碼都要幾千蚊㗎。咁你諗下，咁你收你錢又俾人幾千蚊，你個個都用喎，最慘，完全失去一個保險嘅意義咯。保險係要保大就唔保細，我自己覺認為嚇，點解呢？十個人入面有兩個人入醫院嘅啫嘛，係咪？咁十個人就攤兩個人嘅錢嘅啫。但係而家你十個人，十個人都要睇 out patient 嘅喎，你咪十個人俾十個人嘅錢，咁收完就俾人哋做搞嚟做乜？係嘛？即係大家要明白呢樣嘢先啦。嗰、那個那個那個精神就喺呢度啊！咁希望大家明白呢啲就知道我我我我我點解咁樣諗啦。即係如果一個強制性咧，真係㗎，你無謂嘥啲時間，無謂嘥你啲錢。集中火力做嗰啲真係入住院，我哋大家擔心嗰啲，使幾十萬嗰啲，使十幾萬嗰啲，我唔係單單使五百蚊、六百蚊，甚至睇中醫嗰啲咯。咁所以個精神就喺呢度啦。但係我我會我會帶你睇呢個 point， 我翻去我哋保險界再討論你個問題嚇。OK， 啊，李俊，啊。我係蔡慧宏，香港家庭醫學學院院長，私人執業家庭醫生。啱啱啊，陳議員呢個問題咧，我啱啱就係想問你呢樣嘢，因為頭先周醫生個問題好 relevant 嘅，但我諗我呢個問題更加重要咧，就係希望你帶翻入去俾保險界。我唔知呢個房入面有幾多人有自己買醫療保險，如果冇買，點解唔買？就是、因為得唔到應該得到嘅嘢，而最重要嗰 part 咧，就唔係喺醫院入面。如果你想減少你醫院嘅使費咧，你俾佢哋睇多啲門診，因為咧你每次接觸你嘅家庭醫生就一個最好嘅機會，做好多嘢嘅，包括體檢。而家你哋嘅制度咧，冇病係唔睇得門診噶嘛，但係基本上點解你一年都唔使睇一次醫生嘅咧？你啲血壓高咗你唔知道，你情緒低落你自己都唔知道，
。如果你有機會每一年去睇一次你嘅家庭醫生，做一次你嘅身體檢查嘅記錄，血壓、體重、腰圍、啊、你行入嚟個樣，醫生見到你做咩愁眉苦面，舊年買咗迷債，呢啲都係好重要嘅機會，一個家庭醫生可以發揮佢嘅效用，而減少咗一啲突發性嘅大件事嘅嘢，直接入醫院。因為最昂貴嘅就喺醫院嘅服務，就唔係喺睇個家庭醫生。根本上你而家睇中醫可能貴過嚟睇我，因為你執嗰劑藥咧可能好名貴嘅。嚇、啊、咁所以咧，如果你將無論係公營私營嘅家庭醫生制度推行得好咧，全香港市民都受惠，你哋保險界都受惠。我呢個往廿幾年，我成日叫我啲病人買醫療保險。但係我唔敢介紹邊間保險公司可以買。俾個 example 你，佢就算買咗，我啱啱診斷咗佢鼻咽癌，入私家醫院啦。點知原來發覺佢個電療咧係唔吸發嘅，佢又要走翻去公立醫院，咁又點搞呢？所以我覺得咧，你要好即係清楚，即係個基層醫療個角色嘅重要性，就唔係淨係醫院。希望咧保險界咧係睇到呢、這個，你可能係。俾誒門診嗰部分咧，你要蝕錢，但係長遠計咧，你整體嘅醫療嗰、那個即係賠賠償咧係少咗嘅。我唔知你同唔同意？好啊，好啊，即係我希望咁啊！要今日我好驚今日變咗星途保險大會嘅真係。咁<笑><笑>但係事實呢、這個呢、這個經驗我成日都有嘅，即、就、係、是、我咧我我成我我做咗醫院之後去咗，我諗數以十計嘅去到電台啊、電視訪問咧，通常都話哇你驗疏啲人咧，買時乜都話得，賠咗時乜都唔得。咁呢個真係真嘅，即係我我都絕對同意你嘅啦，<笑>絕對係同意你嘅，絕對同意大家講嘅嘢。所以所以我同個業業界講我都成日同佢講，佢哋佢哋有時有有個別係好自滿咧。我話你千祈唔好講，其實我做你嘅議員真係好真係好淒涼，成日俾人哋咧係係係係係係咁樣話。咁我所以我都話我都我都即係嚇，一方面慚愧，但一方面都希望係真係即係做得個議員咧。其實我哋入到議會咧，我唔係就係代表保險界，我代表全港市民。所以我立場咧係，我唔會執馬燕梭嗰邊嘅，我係要代表全港市民先有意義，因為就冇乜公信力嚇。咁所以咧，頭先你講嘅問題咧係絕對啱嘅。咁我哋要點樣做呢？我諗就係話、呃、第一咧就係、是、始終咧，如果你喺商界度做咧，始終係要睇你嗰、那個即係、就是、你收你嘅錢，賠翻幾多錢俾你，羊毛出在羊身上，呢、這個真係冇辦法避免嘅。咁但係當然我反而我自己喺我嗰個競選，我有講過咧，就話我希望咧係政府推行嗰個全民驗身嘅計劃，真我我真係咁樣乘機 set 我呢個計劃啦。點解呢？我主要同你咁講啊！你個預防性於治療係嘛？如果我哋將來可以話三十歲就一次驗驗身啦，誒、呃、誒兩年一次驗身啦。如果四十歲一年有咩驗身？咁你驗咗身之後即刻知道，有時早啲去處理，政府都慳翻好多資源喎。其實係咪使嘅錢又有限喎？咁所以我覺得咧，我呢個係我其中一樣我真係好想推動嘅嘢咯。咁就係話希望政府咧會推行一個全民驗身嘅計劃啊。咁譬如可能四十歲開始啦，就就一年一次啦。五啊歲又誒誒誒兩年啊喂，即係啱倒翻轉啊。如果四十歲就兩年一次啦，五啊歲一年一次啦咁樣。咁早著早啲去預防啦。咁頭先你講嗰樣嘢咧，其實保險都保險界都知嘅。其實佢哋而家集中都想做嗰啲所謂預防嘅治療啦。但係阿基咧，呢、這個好多時嗰啲計劃咧係喺僱主提供，或者係嗰人自己買咧，係計到錢嘅問題咯。佢佢自己制唔制先係嘛？咁我諗我都係真係唔好意思，又係要帶呢個翻去，希望佢哋我哋會去討論啦。因為我哋喺我哋有個保險業聯會嘅，其實係咁我自己係零五年嘅主席嚟。咁我都係我哋有個 council 係專討論呢啲問題。咁我我將大家今日嘅信息帶翻翻去，希望。我第日出嚟咧，少啲俾人鬧啊！希望，因為因為我仲有四年要係要做咁，我唔想次次佢都俾人鬧。OK， the last question from this gentleman <coughs>。Thank you， 係餘青浩梁醫生，我係中醫，亦都係西醫。咁啊，就誒，就先咧，我就想相應咧，就先個女士講關於 Alive Health 嗰度誒 Alive 或者 Medical Care 嘅問題。咁咧喺 Federation of Medical Society 嘅時間咧，我都係代表嗰邊係一齊有好多嘅 Alive Health 喺度一齊喺邊去向問呢個諮詢文件嗰時反應傾。咁啊，所以咧今日我都再反映嗰樣嘢咧，係未 address 嘅，係未答到嘅。嗰、那個即係話啲啊，其他嗰啲即係點樣喺 per percent per per preventive health 啊，即係點樣人哋可以做嗰啲工作，可以 boost up 嗰啲人嘅病啊，點樣樣？咁我哋係未答到嘅。我哋先首先係講咗都好未答到。好啦，咁喺度咧想希望咧真答答咧就係點樣樣？誒、呃，即係真係講到，係真係喺 prevention 嗰方面，如果真係好多嘢做，咁喺度係未未講之前，我想講翻嗰啲 comment 先。喺度咧，其實咧，我哋嘅 health system 咧，你講得啱，可能病病高盲乜都，或者病高方乜都好。我哋咧個以前我記得哈佛嚟嘅時間 ，Harvard report 嘅時間，醫生咧就停雞
唔做，而家咧就係、是、病人誒誒誒拍咩啊？市民囤雞唔做，一樣嘅問題啫。我哋醫醫學咧就係、是、個叫 trust medicine。Full stop， 冇第二樣噶啦。If you have no trust， 你就好難 work 嘅。我有 trust 就好啲，冇 trust 就都 work 嘅，都 try try 有叫 efficacy 或者 efficiency 或者 evidence base， 都係有困難。OK。我睇到咧，即係今次我哋嘅困難咧，就係我話唔聽八份、六份嘢出嚟翻嚟都唔知邊份 confusion 出嚟就係係咪啊？即係都唔知邊個，亦都影響咗我哋大計。我要睇見出個 report， 我好希好好開心，因為我相信咧 ，government 有成五咁多錢擺落去，真係對我哋我哋嘅好多病人好。我覺得點樣樣咧，就我頭先有好多冇 address 到嘅。我哋今日講兩樣嘢，我諗成個鋪地一樣就係、是、你點樣 effectively 擺。另外，我話點 finance 法？如果 talking about ideology， 我好相信喺呢個概念，我哋係一個好 ideological 嘅人。我好好好對呢方面係我自己做醫生，我做誒誒誒誒邊方面攞係為呢方方面去 ideology。但係 ideology 就好似爸爸教細路仔咁，你個你個爸爸又未必好喎、啊。最慘就係、是、嚇，講明先喎、啊。我爸爸好啊，信曬你，你係神啊，一流啊，唔係啊嘛。咁而家困難咧就係點解咧？你講錢，講翻錢先。錢咧就係、是、好多人咧，就係、是、我聽到出邊咧就講、是、你俾咗錢，我俾咗錢你。就好似人哋即老豆俾仔俾錢俾仔咁，哦佢話一一萬蚊一萬蚊啊，哇一個月一萬蚊咁多嘅，好啦都俾啦，我都有錢。整整下咧，俾完俾下一個月一萬蚊唔夠，俾下又俾下唔夠，嗰叫敗家仔，我叫做。咁點樣講咧？冇我冇敗家政府嘅，因為政府係好人，因為嚇。咁、啊、問題咧，<笑><笑>問題咧就係佢最慘咧，就啲人嘅擔心，就俾咗今日嘅錢，聽日冇嘢進步。嗱 ，this is the poor what we pay does nothing change。我哋而家嘅 change 我睇到咧，我就我哋好多，就先聽到好好嘅 nice presentation， 有得好 change， 有好多好嘅監管，有好多咩？啲啊 advanced countries they done for work for healthcare a long long time。我哋香港唔係咁快㗎，嚟記住啊！八零年代我哋先至係有個所謂 specialist care。OK， 嗰陣時咧就全部 inpatient medicine。再轉嘅話咧，而家就開始一路變緊。就先阿周醫生講。我哋講緊 outpatient， 而又唔好講 inpatient， 講 outpatient， 仲好似你都冇人識咁，仲好似冇人識咁。再講 allied health， 你知唔知世界已經變緊？講緊唔係講淨係 treatment， 淨係 investigation， 係講咧好多 manoeuvre 可以幫個身體好咗咧，佢就時少病咗。啲老人家就係好好好好好，就唔係俾個拐杖咁簡單，可能俾 vitamin， 可能可能最終藥，佢就唔使病啦。哇，正，唔使講咁多嘢，係咪咁講啊？而家好多香港人咧，就如果話唔聽，佢用緊買已經開始用嗰啲叫做。誒、uh, supplement food supplement 點解 food supplement 啊？健康健康食品啊！你我哋我哋做醫生嘅車要鬧佢，我都鬧佢哋。但係你明白嘛？個 culture 已經轉到一個我哋好快轉。原來 unlike unlike UK where it is for for some hundred years and New Zealand which for fifty years, OK， 佢已經 change the system in time 一個一個 step by step， right？ I don't know how to do it， and I I will ask May in May in the the last question I ask on that point。唔好意思，時間有限啊，我可以簡簡短啲好啲。係好快嘅，好快到。咁我 point 咧就係想想講緊咧，就係即係咧，我哋今次講嘅時間咧，我哋希望咧，就一就係誒拉拉翻翻其他嗰啲嘢點樣，我哋嘅 changing system 咧點樣第日咧即係 k d e r for， 因為我哋今日 pay 咗錢咧，你唔能夠 address 個 system， 唔係淨係錢嘅問題，去幫助咗個人咧係點樣係可以知道佢得得到。我誒 ，the last question I ask is for Professor May. Is that I was just talking about the point where our our is trust that have not been possible, as you say, whatever the reason, in this few uh, attempts to change the system by uh, system uh, 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 logistics or by uh, now uh, uh, funding problem and uh, fund funding resources. Whether this is too short. Because the time is different, or because in in the New Zealand or in uh, in UK or in other places where the the change because change usually is precipitated by a need, right? Hong Kong is not. I don't know whether that need is very clear, and also whether this by trust that the people trust that, and whether that uh, uh, can be understood in the context of Hong Kong. Okay, thank you for your question. That is to say, whether <laughs> the Hong Kong is too fast to、oh, cater for something. For Hong Kong is too fast if trust or change by need or need. You see, before I was saying that any change might be driven, <laughs> might be driven by trust. Okay, thank you, thank you, and not so also not necessarily. Okay, by thank you very much for your comment.、Uh, I think Professor may find it more of a comment than a question. But、uh, if you have any, I'd like to answer the question if I knew what the question. Is. <laughs> <laughs> no, the question is that in, in other places, I, I feel it's successful. Was it because they have trust, more trust at that time? 
to show that when it's only policy infused, is all easily accepted? Um, I, I wouldn't regard either country as particularly trusting of politicians. Um, I mean, the, the, I think in both countries there's a degree of cynicism about, about, um, about politicians and democratically elected governments. So insofar as, there, insofar as either of those two sets of reforms has been successful, uh, I, I'm not sure that it's to do necessarily with a very high level of trust. Um, but of course, how do you measure comparative trust across countries? I, I, I don't know. Um, I, th I think it's got more to do with a, a long-term, in both countries, a long-term dialogue um, bet between the public, the professions, and successive governments about the nature of what is valuable in the healthcare system. And for example, a whole series of debates and questioning about the, about if you like, the idea that the health system should be dominated by what the professionals want to deliver. So I think it's more the reflection of, a, of a maybe 25 years of questioning of the assumptions that particularly, particularly the medical profession, but also the nursing profession has made about how they think the health system should be provided. So I think it's, it's part of an intellectual questioning, really, and particularly of, of um, the assumption that that all you have to do is trust the professions and you will get high quality, consistent care. And it's almost driven off the opposite assumption that what you, what you observe in all healthcare systems is unexplained variation in quality and in outcome. So what you have to do in policy is start from the assumption that there is uh, unjustified variation in quality and outcome and think of ways that you can improve it. Okay, I think Sandra has a comment. <coughs> 醫生說我真的很信任你的你說的東西我覺得是對的因為其實在第一期的諮詢有 我也是在這裡可以說我們政府和我們所有的市民一樣是對我們Airline 再解釋了譬如一個community Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Lee and all the panelists. Uh, please proceed to your, to your seat on the floor. May I now call upon our Chairman, Mr. Anthony Wu, to make concluding remarks. Chairman, please. Well, we are coming to the end, to the end of our conference, and I'd like to thank all speakers, panelists, and participants for contributing to the discussion today. In fact, we have more than 400 people attending this conference. I'm particularly pleased that we have had very useful, thorough, and stimulating discussion on healthcare reform, a topic that will have far-reaching impact on the long-term development of Hong Kong. I believe this is also a topic that policymakers, academics, and stakeholders in many parts of the world will have to address in the years to come. We have indeed benefited a lot from our distinguished speakers and panelists 
who have shared with us their insights and perspectives in different key issues, primary care, family medicine, public health care provision, health outcome, as well as financing. As I have said, health care reform is not just about financing. Service delivery is equally, if not more important, in reforming our health care system. For Hong Kong, what is needed at this juncture is more focused and informed deliberations. There are many useful points brought up at today's conference. To conclude our discussions, I think the following points and guiding principles are crucial in considering our health care reform in the future. Primary health care plays a critically important role in serving the health needs of the community. If done properly, enhancing primary care can help improve population health and reduce the need for hospital services, which tend to be more costly. This requires a fundamental change in individual and government behaviours. We are glad to note that the government and the community at large are exploring ways to enhance primary care in Hong Kong. We look forward to seeing more deliberation on this important topic with a view to developing a clear policy to get things going ahead. Experiences in the UK and New Zealand, however, have suggested that equal weights should be given to health outcome. In particular, we need to assess in more quanti quantifiable ways how health improvements can be attributed to primary care reform. In this regard, I believe the experiences of NHS and New Zealand should provide insights into the way forward for Hong Kong. Healthcare financing. It is obvious that this is an issue that we all have to tackle sooner or later. Either this generation or next generation will have to find a way out. This is especially so in the context of Hong Kong in view of our aging population and the escalating medical costs resulting from the rapidly developing medical technology and new drugs. Financing is a matter of choice among stakeholders. Having due regard to our fiscal position, tax base, coverage of health insurance and other relevant factors. Before a public consensus is reached, I think it is, import, it is extremely important to continue to engage the stakeholders in informed discussions on this topic. At the end of the day, healthcare reform should bring about real benefits and improve the quality of our healthcare for the people. The key is to develop a healthcare system that is sustainable, accessible and at the same time affordable. Thank you once again for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you soon again on another occasion. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Please be seated. Thank you once again for active participation today. Before you go, I'd like to make a few house announcements here. Our centre will organise another international conference on the 31st uh, of March uh, on business innovations. This will be the first of its kinds in Asia. More details will be announced later, and we will keep you post. Transportation. If you wish to make use of the shuttle bus service, please get on any one of the three coaches outside. The coaches will depart for MOT MTR station shortly. For those who wish to get an attendance certificate, please go to the counter at the entrance. Lastly, please be reminded to return your headset to our staff outside before you leave. So thank you once again for coming today and wish you all a very peaceful years of the Ox. Thank you.